Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be. I'm Roland Green, director of the Stanford Humanities Center, and I'm glad to welcome you to the second event in our series of lectures called All This Rising, the Humanities in the Next 10 Years. Before we get underway, uh, I'd like to mention that real-time captioning is available for today's talk. Uh, please click on the closed caption icon at the bottom, CC, to start or stop viewing the captioning. The up arrow adjacent to the CC icon permits you to show subtitles, view the full transcript, or adjust captions as needed. This series, All This Rising, began in the fall of 2020 with the aim of bringing attention to ideas and methods that will mark new paths for the humanities in the next decade. The name of the series comes from a poem by Fred Moten in his book, All That Beauty. Quote, all this heroic rising above not hearing and this rising in absolute north against the grain. This is a moment in which despite everything we're enduring, there is all this rising in humanities research, often against the grain. At the Humanities Center, our mission is to bring exciting ideas to our community. And now through Zoom, everyone is welcome in the community. All This Rising is one of four new series we've launched to celebrate our 40th anniversary, not to mention our annual calendar of public lectures and other events. We hope you will want to join us often. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to also mention that this presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website in the coming days. If you'd like to submit a question, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom and we'll do our best to get to it following the lecture. Ricardo Padron joins us today from Charlottesville where he has taught for some years in the Department of Spanish, Italian and Portuguese at the University of Virginia. He is the author of two important books. First, The Spacious Word, Cartography, Literature and Empire in Early Modern Spain, published in 2004, which put him at the leading edge of a group of younger scholars who brought a new degree of textual attention to the documents of the Spanish Empire, in his case with a focus on maps as involved in a complex dialogue with histories and other narratives of conquest and exploration. And then last year in 2020, the Indies of the Setting Sun, how early modern Spain mapped the Far East as the Trans-Pacific West. The new book positions Padron as a leading authority, if not the preeminent figure in the emergent field of trans-oceanic Spain, which joins trans-Pacific and transatlantic studies. In this, he is leading a development in his home fields of early modern Spain and colonial Latin America that is turning those fields global and thus changing how they are constituted and taught. I might put it simply by saying that most disciplines in the humanities posit a world in which they stage their research. Most of us work within that world as a given, but only a few of us change its outlines, and Padron is one of those figures. The book's eight chapters add up to an inexorable argument about how Spain conceived the Pacific, with each chapter focused on a place such as the Spice Islands, the Philippines or China through one or two texts. Uh, for, often I don't, I'm not personally acquainted with the speakers in our, in our various series, but in this case I am. And when we were uh, starting to think about this series and planning it, one of the first ideas I had was, I said, we must invite Ricardo Padron to talk in an expansive way about what the book does to the paradigms in his field and where this kind of work is going next. And I don't want to delay any further, but I want to say one more thing that I admire about him, which is that he is the kind of figure who, when he invests something in some part of our profession, there is no unguided or wasted motion, whether it's his role on the board of the Renaissance Society of America or his connective work in bringing scholars together. For example, in another volume he assembled in 2020 with Christina Lee, the Spanish Pacific, 1521 to 815, 1815, a reader of primary sources, an invaluable book of documents introduced by several of the prominent figures in this emerging area. For those of you watching who might be younger scholars, uh, he is a model, I think, of how to build a career methodically and authoritatively. 
some years ago, Ricardo Padron spoke at Stanford when the recent book was just getting underway. Now we have the pleasure of, of welcoming him back, this time under the auspices of the Humanity Center to celebrate the Indies of the Setting Sun and consider some issues that extend beyond the book. Ricardo, thank you for joining us today. I know there's a lot of anticipation for your talk. Thank you so much, Roland. It's such a pleasure to be here um, and to come back to Stanford at the end of this project when uh, that uh, invitation years ago did so much to stimulate the beginning of the project. So thank you, Roland, and thank you to everyone at the Humanities Center, especially Ed Eric Ortiz, who worked so hard to make this happen. Uh, if you'll bear with me a moment, I have a PowerPoint and uh, let me share it with you before I start the presentation. There we go. Well, so um, uh, Roland asked me to do basically two things, to talk about the book and to talk about some of its implications. So what I've actually done is I've divided the talk into three parts. The first is going to be the fastest, most concise summary of the book that I have ever made for those of you who are coming to it for the first time. In the second part, I'm gonna talk about uh, what I refer to in the title, this question of the phenomenology of distance. I'll explain what I mean by that when we get there. And then the third, I'll provide both some conclusions to the talk, as well as some observations about where I think um, this book takes us and you know, what, you know, what to do next after the Indies of the Setting Sun. So this book began while I was working on my first book, The Spacious Word. I kept on uh, running across, so we're in part one now, um, I kept on running across books like the one you see before you, uh, books written in Spanish about East and Southeast Asia, most of which arose from the exchanges that took place thanks to the Spanish presence in the Philippine Islands and the Trans-Pacific voyages of the so-called Manila Galleons. And um, I kept on running across these, but I found that my colleagues in Spanish departments didn't seem to be paying them very much attention. This, despite the fact that scholars in other fields we're doing very exciting work on those exchanges and on their implications. So we had economic historians like the ones you see here who were rediscovering the importance of the traffic in silver across the Pacific um, and its impact on the creation of the first global economy. We had historians of material culture, and these are just a few examples, who were looking at the luxury goods that came back the other way in exchange for that silver and had a profound impact on the art and the aesthetics of Spanish America. And we had some um, colonial Latin American historians, Serge Grudzinski, I think is the, the most distinguished among them, who were beginning to look at uh, Latin American, colonial Latin America in a global context in which trans-Pacific connections played a key role. But what I thought was, I didn't see that anyone to my satisfaction was really talking about the way that the Pacific was uh, imagined and represented. And so the book began as my attempt to uh, learn something about that. The work led me to appreciate the importance of the Pacific to establish narratives about how, when and about when and how America came to form part of the Western image of the world. Whether one followed traditional scholarship that spoke of America's discovery by Columbus and other explorers, or most re more recent scholarship that spoke of its invention by stay-at-home intellectuals, the Pacific was absolutely indispensable to the argument. When Martin Waldseemuller first mapped the new world as America on his 1507 map of the world, which you see before you, he introduced the idea that it was separated from Asia by a body of water stretching from pole to pole along the entirety of its uncharted Western shore. Here you have a close-up of that little inset map at the top of the image. Nothing in the geographical tradition required him to imagine America as a large island in order to conceptualize it, conceptualize it as the fourth part of the world, yet this is what he did. To invent America, it seemed that one had to isolate it. And I'm using isolate um, with its etymology in mind, its etymology in the Latin word insula, uh, island, and so to isolate is to islandify, let's say. Waldseemuller, moreover, was not alone. According to a whole gamut of historians, it was only when Europeans began to appreciate how vast the Pacific Ocean actually was and began to better understand the shape of its uh, eastern and western shorelines 
that Walter Mueller's invention became a fixture of the European worldview. So whether one privileges an epistemology of discovery or, an, or one of invention, the Pacific plays more or less the same role, that of a geographical and ontological boundary between the continents. Its function is to isolate America from Asia and thereby constitute it as one of the fundamental building blocks of global geography. Now, by the late 17th century, these, function, these functions had become more or less clear, at least in the mind of the French mapmaker, Nicolas de Fer. In his capacity as geographer to the Dauphin of France, de Fer produced a set of large wall maps depicting the continents of Asia, Africa, and America. And these are available on the website of the Bibliothèque Nationale if everyone wants to examine them. I didn't have space to include the Africa map. And he equipped each of them with an elaborate set of vignettes. You'll see them surrounding the cartographic images proper, depicting the native inhabitants of each continent. Clearly, these maps were supposed to help the viewer understand not only the physical, but also the human geography of the world beyond Europe, as well as to appreciate the role of the architecture of the continents. To borrow an expression from Martin Lewis and Karen Wiggin, Karen Wiggin actually, who was present at that Stanford talk that I gave at the beginning of this project. So to appreciate the role of the architecture of the continents as the basic structure of it all. A legend on de Fer's map of Asia uh, addresses global continental architecture explicitly by marking the waters east of China and Japan, part of the great Pacific Sea, which separates Asia from America. The fact that the maps depict anthropological as well as geographical realities suggests that the Pacific also functions as the ontological boundary between an American cultural world and an Asian one. Significantly, this is the only spot on any of the three maps that mentions the role of an ocean in separating one continent from another. The reason for this exceptional treatment of the Pacific and its role begins to emerge when we look at how de Fer deals with one of the last big unknowns in Europe's knowledge of global geography, the far Pacific, where Asia and America might or might not be separated by a body of water. The Bering Strait was not mapped until the 18th century. So on the left, we have Northeast Asia in, the deta in a detail from de Fer's map of Asia, and on the right, Northwestern North America. And you can take a look at these while I, while I speak. So de Fer's maps of the two continents deploy a cagey combination, of blank spaces, hypothetical coastlines, and strategically placed vignettes in such a way as to acknowledge the period's ignorance of the matter of this whole question of whether America and Asia were connected or not, while simultaneously downplaying the significance of the puzzle itself. America is still America, the reader is to believe, whether or not it is truly an island or it is connected to Asia. The legend marking the role of the Pacific Ocean, the one that I showed you before, serves to emphasize this point. No matter what happens in the extreme north, the Pacific does indeed separate America from Asia, as I've said. Of course, the fact that de Fer finds it necessary to downplay the question of the North Pacific and insist on the role of the ocean in isolating America from Asia indicates that there existed an opposing point of view. The Indies of the Setting Sun is my attempt to bring that opposing point of view to light. There, I track the fortunes of that alternative geography against which de Fer sets himself. One was, which was not eager to separate America from Asia, but instead sought to keep them connected in one way or another. One that did not seek to rigorously distinguish between Americans and Asians, but rather sought to identify their commonalities. That alternative geography enjoyed a particularly strong lease on life in the time and place on which I focus, the Hispanic world of the long 16th century, where the hope of reaching the East by sailing West lived on long after Columbus, nourishing repeated attempts to conquer the Pacific and establish a Spanish colony on its Western shores, and even inspiring hopes of conquering continental Asia that enjoyed some level of credibility until the beginning of the 17th century. These efforts produced many of the maps and texts to which I've already alluded. Maps and texts which slice places like the Philippines, the Spice Islands, Cambodia, China, and Japan out of the trans-Asiatic space of the dominant geographical tradition and of Portuguese imperial design and map them into the trans-Pacific space 
of Spain's imperial admissions. To put it simply, they map the Far East as the Trans-Pacific West, which is to say that they invite one to understand East and South relation as the East and the Southeast Asia in relation to the peoples and places of the new world and to Spain's ongoing experience with its colonization. The book, however, does not just focus on this neglected corpus of writing about East Asia. It also addresses the geopolitical work done by some of the best known classics of Spanish Americana, including the writing of Pietro Martire de Arangera, Gonzalo Fernández de Oviedo, Bartolomé de las Casas, Francisco López de Gómara, Juan López de Velasco, and Antonio de Herrera, as well as the cartography that came out of Seville's Casa de la Contratación, both maps directly made in Seville and maps derived from that work. Every text in this corpus, historical or cartographic, has been assigned a prominent role in the story of the ongoing invention of America, not only in the Spanish imagination, but in the Euro broader European one as well. Nevertheless, not a single one of them deals with America alone. All of them devote attention to the various expeditions from that of Ferdinand Magellan onwards, designed to extend Spain's reach across the Pacific and muscle in on the lucrative spice trade. Some of them have even been recognized as crucial contributors to early modern knowledge of Southeast Asia. My interpretations of these texts hinge on these neglected passages, using them to reconsider the ways they map Spain's overseas possessions, which are always referred to as the Indies, Las Indias, occasionally as the New World and almost never as America. Each and every one of these texts reiterates the Spanish interpretation of the 1494 Treaty of Tordesillas by insisting that the hemisphere that the treaty grants to the kingdom of Castilla and Leon spans from the mouth of the Amazon River westward all the way to the Portuguese entrepot of Malacca, taking in most of America, the Pacific, and East Asia. The resultant geography might look to us like a highly arbitrary and deeply unconvincing image of an imperial territory insofar as it locks off a piece of Asia and corrals it together with a chunk of America, despite the existence of an ocean that clearly separates one continent from the other. To see it this way, however, is to say little about the Spanish geopolitical imagination and more about our own investment in the idea that America and Asia are indeed separate, as well as the broader assumption upon which that idea depends, that the continents, are the primary units of global geography, both internally coherent and ultimately indivisible. One of the major assertions of the Indies of Setting Sun is that the early modern Spanish cartographic literature that I examined did not share this assumption. All of the map makers and writers I analyzed had at their disposal other metageographical frameworks besides the architecture of the continents, including climate theory with its embryonic notions of tropicality, a developing hydrography of the oceans as a series of well-bounded interconnected basins, and a closely related tendency to map the world in terms of the sailing routes that Westerners use to exploit it rather than through the major land masses or climatic zones. Spanish cartographic literature deploys these and other frameworks to map the Indies in ways that run against the grain of the architecture of the continents investing the Trans-Pacific Indies with various kinds of internal coherence. Sometimes this means converting South America into a peninsular extension of Asia. At other times, it means emphasizing the importance of the tropics, which allows women to characterize people around the world as savages, no matter which continent they inhabit. At yet other times, it means mapping East Asia as the new imperial frontier where the feats of Cortes and Pizarro might be repeated or the wholesale destruction lamented by Las Casas, redeemed. Invariably, these texts tend to minimize the breadth of the South Sea, as the Pacific was known at the time, and the challenges involved in sailing it. In their hands, the Pacific Ocean does not become a vast watery bar barrier that isolates America from Asia and defines its difference, but a relatively narrow, well-bounded, navigable oceanic basin that serves to integrate its opposing shores. In the official cartography of Spain's empire published in the 17th century, what you see before you right now, the territories around that cozy South Sea become the Indies of the South, the Indies of the North, and the Indies of the West, or as I put it in my title, 
the Indies of the setting sun, Las Indias del Poniente. In many ways, therefore, the Indies of the setting sun represents an effort to read early modern cartographic literature with a period eye. And I should say that I use cart that word cartographic literature to embrace both maps and um, all kinds of written texts that do uh, that map that, uh, that that do the work of mapping. So the book represents an effort to read early modern cartographic literature with a period eye, attentive to the diversity of metageographical frameworks available to early modern world makers. And in order to liberate our understanding of the early modern geopolitical imagination from the historical teleology imposed on it by latter day Americanists. So if we were asked well, some of the implications of this book um, is it asks, the, it, it asks people in early modern American studies uh, or in early American studies about that investment in the notion of America, where that comes from, what it means, how it shapes the field and how it blinds us to other possibilities. So today, I would like to extend that effort to read with a period eye by looking at the likely prototype of the map you see before you, which was published in 1601 as part of Antonio de Herrera's official history of the Spanish experience in the Indies, the Historia General de los Hechos de los Castellanos en las Islas y Tierra Firme del Mar Oceano. Notice that the title does not refer to the deeds of Castilians in the New World or in America, but in the islands and mainlands of the ocean sea. Okay, so let's talk now about this whole issue of the phenomenology of distance. Sometime around 1580, Juan Lopez de Velasco, Herrera's predecessor as the official historian of the Council of Indies, produced this hand-drawn map of Spain's overseas possessions. It served along with a series of regional maps to illustrate a geographical summary or presi that Velasco had prepared for the exclusive use of the king and his counselors. And uh, it's come down to us in two copies, one of which preserves the maps, and that's the one that you'll find in the John Carter Brown Library. And so this image, as well as the other maps from the text are available on the John Carter Brown website. Some version of this map may have accompanied Velasco's earlier work, the Geografía y Descripción de las Indias, which is a major account of the geography of Spain's empire produced by order of the Council of Indies. Now, in many ways, this is a bad map a very bad map, even by the standards of its day. It, or rather the lost earlier version for the, geog for the Geografía y Descripción, the geography and description, was heavily criticized by the Neapolitan cosmographer Giovanni Battista Gesio, a favorite of Philip II, who was asked to review Velasco's work with an eye towards its, its possible publication. Uh, they decided against publication in the end. As Maria Portuondo explains, Jesio criticized Velasco for relying on dubious source material, botching a host of technical issues, and demonstrating his ignorance of the principles of mathematical cartography so dear to Renaissance mapmakers. The cosmographer even went so far as to suggest that Velasco's images were not really maps at all, but were more like battle paintings that capture the memory, that's Jesio's word, the memory of an event rather than the actual reality. In Jesio's words, they resembled the word of a pintor solo practico, a practical painter, rather than a scientifico practico, a practiced or veteran scientist. In my book, I give Jesio the benefit of the doubt, but suggest that the technical poverty of Velasco's maps is precisely what makes them so interesting. These maps are drawn by a cartographic amateur. Velasco was a jurist, who secured his position as official chronicler and cosmographer through his connections to the president of the Council of Indies and not because of any unique qualifications for the job. Everyone can rest assured that this never happens in government anymore. He was an educated person and something of a humanist, but he had no real training in mathematics or cosmography or what I'm assuming is that whatever mathematics he had studied, uh, you know, it, it didn't run very deep and he had no experience of navigation or the use of nautical charts. His maps thus provide an opportunity to explore how such a person imagined and represented geographical space for the benefit of individuals, the king's counselors, whose training and sensibilities were probably more like his own than they were like those of a professional, like the, the, than they were like those of a professional like Jesse. This sort of thing, the spatial imagination of early modern people without technical training, 
was what I was after in the spacious word, where I argued that the mathematically rationalized homogeneous space that was so dear to cartographic professionals and that has been associated with key cultural and ideological shifts in the history of the Western world was not all that widely disseminated in the culture of the 16th century, that there were other spatialities that were in fact the dominant ones and that one has to keep this in mind when reading cartographic literature. Today, I want to bring these ideas from the earlier book to bear on Velasco's map, but utilizing an approach rather different from the one that I utilized back in the spacious uh, word. I want to focus, surprise, surprise, on Velasco's treatment of what we call the Pacific Ocean. As I mentioned earlier, Spanish cartographic literature tends to underestimate the breadth of the South, the South Sea, yet no text with which I am familiar manages to miniaturize it as dramatically as Velasco does on this map. The watercolors suggest that much of the space between America and Asia is taken up by the undiscovered terra australis incognita, although that hypothetical continent is never named. The waters between South America and the brownish patch that I am taking for the terra australis are so narrow that their name, Mar del Sur or South Sea, can only be crammed in vertically. What we might call the North Pacific is handled as if it were an entirely different body of water, which Velasco calls the Golfo de Poniente or Western Gulf. It is clearly bounded by the converging shores of Asia and America on either side and the coast of New Guinea along the bottom. The triangular space so defined is crisscrossed by the sailing routes used by the Manila, by the Manila Galleon. Most importantly, however, the space traversed by those lines seems to be roughly as wide as Velasco's North Atlantic. So the distance more or less from the Canaries to the Caribbean is the same as the distance from Acapulco to Manila. In reality, the distance from uh, uh, Acapulco to Manila is roughly twice as broad as the distance across the Atlantic. And of course, these are very rough illustrative uses of these maps. All of this might be understood as an echo of what was going on in the sort of maps that people like Jessio made or at least took seriously. Such maps claim to use accurate quantitative data to establish the longitude of key positions like the cities of Malacca, Manila, and Mexico, and thereby establish beyond a doubt where East and Southeast Asia lay relative to the imperial boundary line in the Pacific, that they lay on the Spanish side, not on the Portuguese side. The fact that the Spanish and Portuguese could both produce equally quote unquote scientific maps that made opposing claims about the matter was due to the fact that the entire process depended on dubious contradictory sources and highly faulty technical procedures that could be massaged to produce ge different geographical claims. Jessio was a master at this sort of thing. Not only did he assemble a conception of global geography that supported Spain's claim that East and Southeast Asia lay on its side of the treaty line with Portugal, he even claimed that the real location of the frontier in Asia was not the Straits of Malacca, where Velasco puts it, but the mouth of the Ganges River, much, much farther to the West. Arguments like this one earned Jessio a comfortable royal stipend, while arguments to the contrary like those advanced in 1566 by Andres de Urdaneta, earned official condemnation from the crown. There could be no doubt, therefore, that in depicting the Pacific the way he does, as this very narrow expanse, Velasco was simply blowing with the prevailing winds at the king's court, where the interests of power served to resolve the conundrums of cosmography. Yet there is more going on here than what Benjamin Schmidt has so felicitously called cartographic chicanery. I have invited you to notice just how narrow Velasco's Golfo del Poniente seems to be by alluding to real life distances across the Atlantic and the Pacific, ignoring the fact that Velasco's map is clearly not drawn to scale. There is no grid of latitude and longitude. You can see um, a rectilinear grid on this map. That's not necessarily a grid of latitude and longitude, but a device that is used for copying maps uh, from one page to another. Uh, the fact that it's not graduated suggests that it's not a grid of latitude and longitude. There's no scale of distance. There's no evidence of any attempt to model real world spatial relationships using the mathematical tools of Renaissance cartography. 
For Desio, this was a reason to dismiss the map altogether. For me again, it's a reason to look at it more closely, remembering that it was made by a jurist for the benefit of the king and his counselors. They did not need convincing about the rightness of Spain's territorial claims, and so did not need the quantitative, the quantitative information about distances and longitudes that were necessary to support those claims. Moreover, as men of letters whose numeracy probably did not run as deep as that of the specialists who made real maps, they probably did not see any problem with a map that was bereft of such information. But what then was the map designed to say to them and what would they have seen in it? I argue that through this map, Velasco taught the king and his council that the Indies of the West were within Spain's effective grasp. Let me explain what I mean by that. In order to understand this, I draw on the work of philosopher Edward Casey, who's very good at helping us understand our relationship with space and place in ways that are free of calculation and number. In what follows, I hope to suggest that future work on the early modern geopolitical imagination could benefit from more intensive use of contemporary spatial theory, not only of the critical variety associated with Henri Lefebvre, David Harvey, and others, but the phenomenological kind associated with Casey, Malthus, and, uh, and other figures. Although Casey has written exclusively about maps, here I have in mind his, pro his provocative discussion of near and far in what may be his most important book, Getting Back Into Place. There he argues that our notions of what is near and what is far are, quote, not only resistant to geographical actuality, but may be actually independent of it, unquote. That these notions, which we all too readily understand through numerical accounts of either distance or time, that's five miles away, it's a week's travel, quote, are especially averse to exact determination of a metric sort, including determination by geographical distance, unquote. They vary enormously according to the situation and respond to a gamut of cognitive and emotional factors, including memory. They reflect, quote, the particular way I'm inserted into my life world at a given moment, unquote, rather than any objective measurement of either space or time. The subsequent discussion distinguishes among three zones that surround the intentional conscious body, that of the near, the far, and the distant. The near zone begins with everything that is readily at hand, what is within our reach, but also extends to all things we could reach. The example suggests that Casey is thinking about things we could reach with minimal bodily displacement, such as those that are in our room or directly outside our house. But the argument explicitly includes things that are made near through technological intermediaries like the telephone, television, or I would add, Zoom. There is such a thing therefore as a virtual nearness. Objects in the far zone, are those that require a type of movement that Casey calls ranging, but which he never explicitly defines. The examples here include the purposeless wanderings of the urban flaneur and the, the purposeful travel of a religious pilgrim in the Himalayas. The far sphere extends out to the horizon, understood as a border zone where the far zone gradually gives way to the distant zone. That is, to that zone where we locate objects that lie entirely beyond our grasp through either reaching or ranging. In order to bring this discussion to bear on Velasco's map, we must remember that early modern Europeans often perceived geographical space through a perspective that was much more down to earth than the God's eye point of view inherent in maps. And this includes people who were perfectly literate in maps in cartography and who used maps and even published maps. For example, in this passage from Richard Hacklett's Principal Navigations, written during the 1580s, we read that the provinces of New Mexico, Quivira, and Cibola, in what is now the southwestern United States, are situated on the backside of Huastecan, on the Gulf Coast of modern Mexico, Florida, and Virginia. The implied author thus adopts a location that he shares with the implied reader, London, let's say from which he looks out across the Atlantic to a new world imbued with specific dimensions, a front side and a back side. To put it in the terms outlined by Casey, Hacklett locates the Eastern and Western provinces of the continent of North America 
somewhere in those zones of varying felt proximity that emanate from the intentional and placed conscious body. We might say that he places Virginia, Florida, and Huastecan in the near zone, and New Mexico, Cibola, and Quibola in the far zone. Or maybe he places all of them in the far zone, but at varying degrees, at two different degrees of farness. The zones um, uh, uh, lend themselves to sort of an infinite grad gradation. How we decide this particular matter depends on the extent to which we believe that early modern geographical representation can create the sort of virtual nearness that Casey associates with modern telecommunications technologies. I'm gonna set that question aside and insist that one thing remains unchanged, no matter how we answered the question I just posed. For Hacklin, none of the three countries are distant. Uh, that is Mexico, uh, uh, New Mexico, Cibola, and Quivira. None of them are beyond the grasp of reaching and ranging. This is because all of them have been visited, if not inhabited, by the explorers whose experiences are related in the series of texts that this remark serves to introduce. Those texts can be understood as tales of that unique sort of displacement that has as one of its principal effects the conversion of places that were once distant into places that are merely far away. Something similar can be said about the lines that trace the routes followed by the Spanish fleets on Velasco's maps. And you'll see those lines crossing both the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. On one level, they are there to help the king and his counselors understand the transportation network that makes empire possible. On another, they register the existence of a built infrastructure or of established itineraries that like the streets of the Flaneur or the pil pilgrimage route of the devotee constitutes the condition of possibility for the act of ranging. Or perhaps they might be understood as traces of repeated acts of ranging. The multiple crossings of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans by Spanish shipping that have served to incorporate once distance pla distant places, first the New World and then the Philippines, into the far zone of the Spanish imagination, if not into some sort of a virtual near zone. By this account, the narrowness of the Pacific, of Alaska's Pacific, does not echo the faulty or selective calculation in support of Spain's dubious claim to East and Southeast Asia, characteristic of good maps. It constitutes yet another trace of the felt proximity made possible by the repeated sailings of the Manila Galley. The map is drawn 15 years after the Galleon route is established. By mapping the South Sea in this way, narrow, contained, bordered, and crisscrossed by established navigational routes, Velasco reflects that sense of felt proximity and communicates it to the king and counselors. He tells them that East and Southeast Asia are just as much within reach of Spanish America as Spanish America is of Spain itself. His map is not a bad map at all, but a very good one. Although it says nothing about the distances and longitudes at the heart of Spain's territorial claims, it effectively demonstrates how the lived experience of regular, predictable transportation across the Pacific, however perilous ocean travel was in reality, actually drew Asia closer to America in the Hispanic imagination. Allow me now to step back from this particular example to draw some broader conclusions from all of this. First, I recognize that I'm hardly the first person to talk about the question of distance in the early modern world. Yet I hope my observations today might serve to inflect that conversation. Since Brodel, at least, we've been accustomed to thinking of distance as a chronic challenge to early modern culture, especially to the exercise of sovereignty. We often fasten on the many ways that long range control repeatedly failed, creating opportunities for independent action on the local level. Yet it is also possible to speak of the ways in which distance was actually conquered, at least by comparison with previous eras, and of an early experience of time-space compression. We would do well to remember the observation of the Spanish historian Francisco López de Gómara, who bragged that while the ancients could only ponder the existence of the Antipodes, the moderns sailed there all the time, as if with their eyes closed, is the expression he uses. We might also recount the comment of one of the Borgias, who was delighted to see the world represented on a globe because it helped him appreciate 
how small it actually was. So I think this is an implication for us. For those of us who want to think about uh, colonial America in a global context, we would do well to think about how um, places that were obviously distant and remained distant by the standards of our own measure of distance, of our own um, sort of technologically mediated experience of distance, um, how they were actually made closer. Allow me to end though on a rather different note. Ultimately, the invention of America is important because it is inseparable from the invention of the Native American. And with it, the initial consolidation of a line of thinking, both geographical and anthropological, that informs the history of racial thinking. It is no accident that one of the texts that bore a great deal of the responsibility for popularizing not only the idea that America was a continent separate from Asia, but also the idea that the continents constituted the fundamental architecture of global geography opened with this famous image in which the parts of the world appear as a group of quasi-racialized female figures. This illustration from Abraham Ortelius's Teatro, Teatro Sorbus Terrarum of um, Teatro Morbus Terrarum of 1570 is clearly an ancestor of the de Faire maps we saw earlier, which group human beings according to the continent they inhabit and to countless images from the 19th and 20th centuries depicting the so-called five races of man, which 18th century intellectuals identified from the, perspective, from the perspective afforded by the architecture of the continents as they understood it. Juan Lopez de Velasco drew his map roughly 10 years after the publication of Ortelius's Atlas, which was dedicated to Philip II and very well known in the Spanish court. His image evinces the existence of a countercurrent in European world making with anthropological as well as geographical implications. That countercurrent drew Asia and America closer together rather than separate them, and in so doing, sorted the world's populations rather differently. What are the implications of this countercurrent for our understanding of the ongoing collaboration between geography and anthropology in the development of racial thinking? Certainly, that other way of mapping the world and its people does not get out from under emerging notions of Eurocentrism and of white supremacy. Its complicity in imperialism and colonialism is absolutely patent. Yet it nevertheless provides an interesting vantage point from which to survey more familiar cartographies and taxonomies. Like maps that adopt unusual orientations or alternative centers, the very existence of that alternative tradition helps us appreciate the deep arbitrariness of the political and scientific orders that came together during the Enlightenment and that continue to look obvious to many people today, even after all these years of critique. It also provides an object lesson in the ability of the European imagination to pick and choose among the metageographical frameworks at hand in order to map places and peoples in ways convenient to power. What other combinations? What other strategies? What other cartographies remain to be discovered when we approach the history of the geographical imagination better attuned to its own internal diversity? Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, you know, that talk, um, as you said at the outset, not only began with the most um, succinct possible uh, summary of the new book, The Indies of the Setting Sun, but also is loaded with so many challenges to people in a variety of fields that you are um, connected to that what I'd like to do, if I can, in the next few minutes in our question period, uh, and I, I think some of our, some of our um, uh, audience members are thinking along the same lines. What I'd like to do is try to draw you out about some of those challenges and 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 what you see as as the implications of them. Um, you know, listening to you, I, you know, obviously I've heard you talk about this material before, and I've read the book closely. Uh, but one thing that occurred to me in this uh, rendition is that um, uh, quite apart from what you're uh, presenting as uh, fresh thinking to people in your immediate fields of early modern Spanish literature and culture, uh, colonial Latin American, and then extending outward, you're also, uh, in a sense, 
um, educating even people who aren't scholars who might believe that the concept of the Pacific Rim is a is a late 20th century invention, <laughs> you know. Uh, there were, what you're showing is there was a Pacific Rim long before we heard about it in the 1980s. And that, uh, you know, that it's, it's as is in the modern version, it's driven by, by commerce and by power. And, you know, and there's a history to this concept. The modern version of the Pacific Rim is also a, a if you want to think of it this way, a feat of distance, using the concept of distance to render something that might otherwise seem, be seen to be far away as actually near in a different sense. So mm -hmm. what I want to start by asking you about is that notion of distance and how you use it, because it's obviously a supple concept in, in your terms. So you talked about um, the question of distance in the map by Velasco. Uh, how about in historical writing? Uh, how 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 is that concept used and deployed when it's when the when the object in question is not a map but a narrative or a chronicle or something like that? Well, um, you know, I'm so glad you asked that, um, Roland. Uh, when I came to speak here at Stanford years ago, you asked me how is distance represented in these um, uh, in these texts, and one of the things I admire is that you're sort of the person who, who asks a question that then kicks around in my head for years and years. Um, so I'm happy to have an opportunity to respond. Um, one of the things that my students always note about reading, um, uh, you know, the texts that come out of Spanish expansion in a new world is how little time is spent describing um, the actual travel across the ocean or the actual travel across the continent. Mm -hmm. Even something like Cabeza de Vaca, which we think of as this cartography of a vast swath of North America, um, it's arranged as a series of places. Um, uh, in other words, the, the distances in between don't matter as much. Um, uh, ocean voyages are often a matter of, we left Acapulco on this date, we arrived at Manila, uh, the next date, and nothing is said about the three or four uh, uh, months in between. Um, and I think this has to do with, and this is one of the reasons why I think Edward Casey is so, is so interesting, with the fact that we're dealing with a period that still thinks of, um, of a place world, to use Casey's language, mm -hmm. rather than of spaces. And so intervening spaces simply don't have the kind of interest. But the effect for the reader, I think, is a sort of a drawing near. Um, uh, there's a wonderful article by uh, by Ted Keichi on uh, that draws a contrast between Columbus and Vespucci. You mm -hmm. know, Vespucci gives us that storm in the Mundus Novus letter. In Columbus, there's no storm, um, and we have when we have no storm, when we have no adversity, when we don't even have a narrative of a voyage, then there's a sense of of drawing near, of an intellectual at least drawing near that wouldn't be there. Um, if we told that. It's very different when you read accounts of the Mendania voyage, where you actually spend a lot of time talking about the miseries of the voyage from the mm -hmm. South Pacific to the Philippines, and you really feel the, the sort of the distension of oceanic space. Uh, we've got many questions from the audience about distance, so let me follow up with a couple of those. Um, does the near, far, distant imagining bring special importance to travel journals of explorers, which then assist the supposed reader in locating themselves right there with the traveler as they bring the rest of the world near. Yeah. I guess you know, the, 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 the implication of the question is, does this kind of reading have a special purchase in what we would, what we used to call, maybe still call travel, travel literature? Absolutely, absolutely. And this is one of the things that I was trying to allude to when I made the brief remarks about Hacklet is that I think that's the function of travel literature, is that it brings places out of the distant zone into the near or the far zone. Uh, but I think it is very important to keep, it's a very brief discussion. This is a couple of pages in Casey, but it's an incredibly provocative one. Um, and uh, it's when we bring that tripartite distinction, the, the notion that just because things are far away, we don't see them as uh, inaccessible or irrelevant to us. Those are, those are, that's the distant, when it's inaccessible or irrelevant. And I think that's one of the things that travel literature does, is it converts places that are possibly distant into places that are uh, uh, perceived as merely far. Um, 
now here, here's a couple of related questions uh, from uh, a current fellow at the Humanity Center. Um, uh, thank you so much for this uh, incredible talk. I hope we can continue the conversation at some other time. I'm quoting, uh, for now I have, I have a question uh, about the concept of framing. Do you take into consideration the relationship between the framing of Asia as the Trans-Pacific West and what was being carried out on the ground. Is framing past or present events different from a future-oriented framing? In other words, this Pacific West within reach, is this Pacific West within reach or has it already been reached somewhat? Does the discussion of whether the representation of the Pacific West is a justification of something that has already happened while also instigating the confirmation of such images and of uh, the, con I'm sorry, the continuation of such voyages and colonialization inflect the argument in any way. I would think about these texts as in effect a hinge between those two possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, um, the fact that um, Spaniards have reached the Philippines, have established themselves there, and have begun to have direct contact with Japan and China, independently of the Jesuits or the Portuguese, that's what makes them, um, uh, that was, that's what takes those countries out of the distant zone. And it's what makes possible imagining that area as a frontier. In other words, I can't think about the possibility of conquering China until, con until China is in my far zone, not my mm -hmm. distant zone. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I mean by, by, by them playing this hinge function. Uh, they both respond to uh, certain things that have happened on the ground and make possible sort of the next move, the, the next series of possibilities. I think uh, this is my own observation, but I think that um, one of the real contributions of this project for, for those of us who are also early modernists, but are not cartographically oriented like me, you know, people who use maps in their work, but not in this kind of um, extremely uh, detailed way that you do, but use them, say, as evidence for, for this or that argument that we're making. I don't think, I'm, I'll just speak for myself, but I think that many of us in, in that category don't sufficiently appreciate how forward maps were in the early modern world. That is to say, how they were making a new reality as much as they were responding to, uh, as, as, the, as the questioner says, reality is already on the ground and how much, and, and you know, I think it must be a challenge for people like you who are really, whose whole argument is, is sort of based in maps to, to dis discriminate between the ones that are, uh, in a sense, describing a world, uh, uh, an aspirational world or an imaginary future world versus those that are um, that are um, collating uh, the information brought in by explorers and just recording it. You know, is that does that make sense? Yeah, the fact is that there is no such thing as just recording information on a map in yeah. the 16th yeah. century because uh, simply yeah. because the, the the techniques are not there yet, um, uh, and you get these wonderful stories of cosmographers in Seville who interview pilots and find out that if you follow the pilot's measure of distance, it seems like they sailed their boat deep inland, you know? Yeah. Um, there's just absolutely no agreed upon set of procedures because no procedure actually works. Yeah. Um, and so any map, even the, one that, the, the ones that seem to be most technically accomplished um, and the most accurate, so to speak, are always built upon a series of compromises with the source material that converts them into something like fiction, you know? And I think this is why I've always felt comfortable talking about maps as someone with, with literary training is because I do see a type of creativity at work um, in, just, in just about any early modern map. You just have to dig deeply enough to, uh, to see where that creative move is taking place. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit because we have a number of questions about um, um, about race and about populations in the in the early modern world. So let me let me uh, paraphrase a question from a, a member of the audience. Um, what role do theories about the origins of indigenous peoples of the Americas um, play in the framing of the continents as connected? Um, do these discussions bring to bear? 
how do the what do these discussions bring to bear on each other or are they parallel but not directly related phenomena of meta geographical and historical interpretation that frames asia and the americas as lands to be occupied by the spanish empire yeah, yeah i talk something about uh, i talk about this a little bit in the book because if you look at the cartography of the uh of the, poly, the Antwerp Polyglot Bible, or if you look especially at Jose da Costa, who has that famous discussion of the origins of the Amerindians that concludes that the only way we can reconcile the existence of the Amerindians with the biblical narrative is by positing a physical connection between America and Asia. Yes, uh, questions about the origins of the Amerindians are very much connected to geography. Um, um, they're, um, uh, but the strange thing is that, you know, I, and I think this is, this is, I think asking, for example, about the influence of Acosta is very important here, because at one point in the 16th century, we stopped getting maps that physically connect America and Asia. Early on in the 16th century, they're very much connected. It's actually the norm uh, during the first half of the, of the 16th century. We stop getting maps that connect the continents. They tend to leave that space blank. But I always wonder if um, you know the influence of Acosta and his followers is so profound that we can use that to understand how those blank spaces were read. In other words, when people looked at that, what did they assume about what was likely there? Um, and I think I think there was this very, there was this deep investment in in this kind of geographical continuity, largely for these theological anthropological reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Here's a question from a, a Stanford colleague who is an early modern historian. Uh, uh, it, it would be it would begins as a comment. It would be interesting to consider the role of the Jesuit uh, relations as they are regularly printed in establishing a new understanding of distance and space, first for themselves and then for their early modern readers. Many individual Jesuits offer a first person understanding of the issues you raise because they experience these distances in stages as they and uh, as, as they are sent to different places or have to consider the possibility that they will be sent to different places. And, um, um, and often the mission changed in the years they waited there to go to China or to go to Brazil. Uh, or to go to Japan, or to go to Mexico. Does 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 that has that? I think that is. I think that's a beautiful project, uh, and it's certainly for someone to do. I don't know if I'm <laughs> if I'm the man. I did dabble in a Jesuit um, uh, in some Jesuit accounts, the ones at the Real Academia de la Historia in Madrid, um, and I and, and and I came to them with some frustration. I was looking at this one uh, Jesuit text that was about the the first Jesuit mission to go to Tibet. And what I was really interested in is what these, these uh, priests would have to say about the journey from Goa or wherever it is they, they, they left on the Indian coast up to the Himalayas. And it was just like what I was describing earlier. They said, we left on such and such a date and we arrived in Lhasa the next day and we find out nothing about the intervening space. Um, and so there's a way in which Tibet in that text becomes this kind of island that is almost decontextualized, uh, it, you know, I, I think we need to think of the, the genre of the solario uh, when we think about these texts. Um, but, you know, of course, the Jesuits are all depending on Portuguese infrastructure to get to the east. And uh, one of the things I, one of the reasons I didn't spend much time to the, with the Jesuits is because I figured that they would be doing what we would expect people to do with China, with Japan, with Southeast Asia, which was map them into the east. Um, and of course, I was interested in writers who were trying to map things into the West. Um, and there is a chapter in the book where I consider a Jesuit history of Japan written by a Spaniard and how it actually engages with these issues. You know, how the, there's a little battle over what is actually the Orient and where the Orient ends and begins. Um, it involves a little bit of reading between the lines of Jesuit descriptions and why they make certain moves. Um, uh, and there are there is a Spanish text about China, Bernardino de Escalante, um, which is all about the route. Um, it's all about convincing the reader that the Portuguese route to China is long, involved, and dangerous, while the Spanish route across the Pacific is quick, easy, and convenient. Um, and it's all a matter of remapping China. In other words, getting the reader not to think of it as a place on the eastern end of the Portuguese and Jesuit journey to the east, uh, but of the um, uh, the western end of the Castilian journey to the west. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
where uh, the the uh, the audience is very, I'm being pulled in different directions because the audience is interested in so many different aspects of this talk. I'm trying to please everyone bear with me and Ricardo as I try to fashion this into a coherent conversation. Um, here's, a, here's an interesting um, uh, uh, question that perhaps ties together two of the things we've been talking about. I'm interested in your notion of extended tropicalismo, uh, mm. particularly in terms of how climate and weather relate to the phenomenology of distance. Would it be possible to flesh out more how you arrived at the notion of an extended tropicalismo and what types of sources, both primary and secondary, frame your understanding of it? Um, the, the easy answer to the question is I read Nicolás Gómez. Um, if there was any book that had a profound influence on the shaping of the argument, it was Nico's uh, The Tropics of Empire, mm -hmm. uh, because he was the one that taught me uh, they're not always thinking about continents. And if we're asking questions about Asia versus America, we could be missing the point entirely. Um, and so it was by reading Nico that I learned to read for the concern with climate and tropicality. Um, and, um, and so I, I would refer the questioner to Nico's work, which I think does a splendid job. There's also um, uh, Christine Johnson's uh, the German discovery of the world has a wonderful reading of the Waldseemuller map uh, as a map not about America at all, but about the tropics. Uh, it's you know it's just as much about Sub-Saharan Africa and the Indies as it is about America. Um, so uh, the notion of reading for tropicality that's not an invention of mine. That's something that I've taken from these these other just wonderful colleagues um, to try to. Uh, uh, think more directly about the question of metageography. Uh, uh, you'll notice that this Lewis and Wigan book has been very important to me. And uh, I think one of the most important points they make in the architecture of the continents is that metageographies are plural. You know, that sometimes we think in terms of continents, sometimes we think in terms of East, West, Orient, Occident, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure if they were to rewrite it, they might say global North and global South. Um, uh, but when we turn to the early modern period, we don't expect to see that kind of metageographical diversity. And what mm -hmm. my book is saying is that, you know, we've always thought this way about the world. We've always used different frameworks in different combinations, someone sometimes slipping from one into the other as the situation demanded, um, and often as, you know, powerful interests demanded. Yeah, yeah. Um you mentioned that the Spanish geopolitical imagination sorted human populations into boxes that were not the same as those suggested by continental thinking. Could you yeah. tell us more about that? Um, it has to do, I think, with the whole notion of Asia um, uh, and whether, you know, what do the Chinese and the Japanese have to do with the South Asians or with the Muslim world? Um, and what I see in these texts, what, the, what I see these texts doing is thinking about East and Southeast Asia as an entirely separable region, not only because there's a line that cuts through it making Spanish, but in sort of deeper ways. And so, for example, uh, the chapter on Japan addresses this book, um, which is all about the, the martyrdom in Nagasaki um, uh, in the 1590s. Um, and it gives a very curious account of the origins of Buddhism. Um, the writer believes that Buddhism begins in Siam and spreads from there to uh, Cambodia, to China, to Japan, to Korea. In other words, what he does is he completely misrecognizes the South Asian origins of Buddhism, which were already clear to the Portuguese. And so this is one of the ways in which East Asians are converted into a cultural group that exists in isolation from other Asians. In other words, the category of the Asian is not really what's at work up there at all. The East Asians have their own kind of religious identity because the most important, what, what this writer believes to be the most important uh, religion of the, of the region is not imported from India, it's actually homegrown. Uh, so that's one way. Um, the other way is that there's this continued bafflement. Uh, tropicality is both a resource and a problem. Um, uh, in the new world, I think the, the Spanish are faced with the conundrum that the distribution of human populations is exactly the opposite of what climate theory would predict. Because the most advanced societies are in the tropical areas 
of Mesoamerica in the Andes. But when they go to the temperate areas, especially of North America, where they're expecting to find dazzling civilizations, you know, they find buffalo herds and nomads. Um, and so I, I have a pet theory that I think in some way the concept of the Amer of America is a solution to this, this conundrum. Mm -hmm. Of course, when, when the Spanish reach Asia, there the populations sort themselves out um, the way climate theory would expect them to. You know, the Japanese and the Chinese are in the northern temperate zone, whereas the Filipinos are in the tropics and they're not seen as, as civilized people. As a matter of fact, they're seen as Indians just as much Indians as the people of the new world. Um, so there's nothing coherent in this, you know, or at least I don't see anything coherent. I see this sort of constant improvisation uh, uh, trying to accommodate theoretical tools to um, the lived realities of, of these encounters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now uh, I, I want to turn to a couple of questions that people have about the, I guess the more, um, um, disciplinary implications of what you're doing. So um, let me begin with a question. Uh, hold on, I have a, uh, most, most people who are trained in your home disciplines, presumably in departments like the ones you teach, like the one you teach in, uh, are uh, still um, imagine themselves as primarily working on the literature of early modern Spain and or the literature of the colonial and culture of the colonial Americas, and increasingly um, scholars in those categories. Um, now, oh, you and I remember when when transatlantic emerged as a as a professional yeah. category wasn't that long ago, yeah. and um, and and then increasingly, of course, people in the area of colonial Latin America now find it um, important to to uh, add indigenous languages to their training. Um, what are the implications for how how undergraduates are taught and for how graduate students will be trained based on the kind of work that this book opens up, having to work in the Far East, having to imagine the, the, the East as the West and all the rest of that? Yeah, well, I do think that the future of this particular field of trans-Pacific studies um, uh, involves the creation of networks of collaboration. Um, you know, establishing these kinds of relationships with sinologists, with people who study Japan, uh, who, uh, with uh, Filipinologists, of course, people who actually have the Tagalog, who have the Mandarin, who have the Japanese. Absolutely. You know, it's 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 not possible. I mean, my book does not pay attention to indigenous or native perspectives because I knew I couldn't do that without a mastery of a whole bunch of languages um, that I was never going to master. You mm -hmm. know. Uh, so I do think that um, there's a need for collaboration with specialists um, on the other side of the Pacific. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I had the opportunity then to go with some early modernists to the, Associ the Association of Asian Studies, and we got a, we had a wonderful reception from sinologists who were interested in the panel that we were giving. Uh, so collaboration with other fields. Um, and, um, you know, when people ask me, Ricardo, are you an early modernist? Are, are you a peninsularist or a colonialist? I really don't know the answer to that question anymore. Yeah. Um, I do yeah. think that uh, when we ask ourselves, what, what is the investment in peninsular studies? Um, the investment is off, it often has to do with um, um, preserving the notion of Spain as a field of study on a level with France or England. Um, it also has to do with preserving the category of the literary. Um, because when we ask ourselves what is going on in um, uh, early modern cultural studies, early modern peninsular cultural studies, you know, what do we see? We see um, a whole industry of people who are interested in gender and who write about nuns. We see an industry of people who are interested in the history of science. Uh, yet there, I think there are a whole range of topics that continue unaddressed because the field continues to be dominated by the consideration of canonical literature. And I have nothing against scholarship on canonical literature. I certainly have no problem teaching it. One of my favorite classes to teach is Don Quixote. Um, but there's still all, there's a whole sea of unanswered questions and unexplored problems. Um, and I do think that for many of them, in other words, um, do you adopt a trans-Pacific approach, a transatlantic approach? Do you uh, work with indigenous languages? Do you collaborate with an Asianist? Um, I think that it all has to do with the question that we're asking. And we need to become a field that um, picks its materials and its methods 
according to the question that is asked, not on the basis of a canon of texts, whether that canon is that literary canon that is still so important yeah. in peninsular studies, or um, the canon of, um, of Cronicas de Indias, Chronicles of the Indies, which still structures the training, at least, of colonialists. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, for years, I've taught a course uh, called the Transatlantic Renaissance, a graduate seminar, mm -hmm. and I'm preparing to teach it again this coming year. I have probably taught it for over 20 years. And there was a time in which that was a kind of uh, very forward looking sort of course. Uh, now with the publication of the Indies of the Setting Sun and all the other important work that you're doing with Christina Lee and other collaborators, I'm gonna call that course the Transoceanic Renaissance. And uh, I mean, every word is problematic, right? Renaissance is problematic too, but uh, you know, every word is a moving target these days. But I, yeah. but, but I would, what I'd like to do is make the course about this transformation in the field that's taken place right. in, the, in the last right. few years, you know, or these I multiple think, transformations in the field. Yeah. One of the important observations is that when you look at a lot of the people who are in Spanish departments in the United States who are working on trans-Pacific issues, uh, and I'm thinking of Jody Blanco, of Christina Lee, of Miguel Martinez, all of them friends and people I admire, mm -hmm. but all of them like me, their, pri their primary training is in golden age studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to some extent, Trans-Pacific studies is an answer to how does golden age studies continue to be relevant in a field that is shifting decisively towards matters Latin American, and that is becoming less and less interested in canonical literature. When you reflect on your own training, I mean, you were, as an undergraduate, you were educated in the same department that you now teach in, right? And you were... Uh, I, I, my undergraduate degree is actually in political and social thought. So oh, I didn't no, know that. I, okay. I, was not a, yeah. I have three different degrees in three entirely different subjects. I see. Okay. But but then your graduate... But I did degree. take classes. One of my, my mentor at UVA was Gustavo Peyong, who is now a, a dear friend and colleague. So mm -hmm. I had connections to this. When you, when you think back on your training... Uh, uh, you know, the undergraduate training at UVA, then your graduate training at, at Harvard. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you reflect back on that now from the vantage point of the work you're doing now? Is there, is there, how do you assess the strengths and limitations of that, the most of that training? The most thing I learned uh, as an undergraduate and as a graduate school, uh, as a graduate student was to read closely. Um, I was always drawn to professors who emphasized the close reading of texts. And, you know, my beloved dissertation director, Mary Gaylord, I think she's a brilliant reader of poetry. Absolutely. And I tell my graduate students, I learned to read maps by reading poems. Um, and I still emphasize um, the reading of poetry with my graduate students, because I think it's where we hone. Um, really careful attention to language and really careful attention to the subtleties of texts. Um, and then I kind of discovered that I had this, I don't know, aptitude, I suppose, for visual stuff, stuff that mm -hmm. it turns out not everyone in my field has. How did you, so how, did you how did you discover that? that? How did you discover that? Um, I, um, my interest in maps and literature uh, came from a seminar I took at Harvard with Doris Summer. Mm -hmm. uh, where I had committed to writing about um, uh, Kumanda, uh, Juan Nomera's uh, famous romantic novel. And the thing that most struck me, were, as, as it strikes many people, were the landscape descriptions and the setting in the Amazon. I went to the library to look for... Um, uh, for materials to get a paper, and you know, it's 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 a testament to the to, to having a wealthy library to go to. Uh, a, one with a rich collection, um, they had all these 19th century Ecuadorian geography books published in Ecuador, mm -hmm. and they had these maps, and they just started playing around with them, and um, and uh, um, and found that I had something to say about them. You know, it um, it just came to me, I suppose. I think I've always looked. I've always looked at maps. You know, I've always I've, since I was young, I would decorate my rooms with with, with, mm. with maps. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's come. It's been something that's with me all my life. I think. And you know, the other question I would that comes out of my own curiosity, but I think audience members are also interested in this is how, if you could sort of narrate for us this kind of your own development in this, how how do you work up? How did you work up? And how do you continue to refresh? your contact with uh, human geography, with a, a discipline that is, as you know, 
is often not represented in in many of our institutions. Yeah, uh, it's not and, it's not represented at UVA, and it's um, uh, it, I suffer from that. Yeah, um, yeah. The, what I did last semester was I taught a class called Space and Place in Hispanic Literature. Hmm where we read a different spatial theorist with a different text. And we ranged across peninsular and Latin American literature from colonial to uh, modern day things. Um, uh, and it was the first time that I really went back and started reading spatial theory in, in many years. And I think this, this paper in effect comes out of that. It comes out of this attempt of my own to return to people like Casey, like Lefebvre, like David Harvey, mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, so, so that's what I do. I try to, to read what I can. Um, the wonderful thing about our pandemic conditions is that now we can go to talks everywhere and anywhere. And so I'm hearing talks about uh, from other people who work on space and texts that uh, I wouldn't have heard otherwise. Um, uh, and that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I've I've had uh, I, I don't obviously I don't work on it in the in the uh, intensive way that you do, but I have found Casey in particular to be such a useful resource in a way, yeah. because um, he is uh, like certain other uh, I guess speculative geographers. Uh, another one is Yi Fu Tuan. I don't know yes, if you've work. Yeah. You know where 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 they are. They are very productive about coming up with concepts that can be elaborated in other disciplines, and right. uh, and so when you when you find people like that, you stick close to them and yeah. you follow them, you know, and uh, and you and you make of them what you can, which is clearly what you've been doing with all of the cons the rich concepts that you've been developing in this project. Right. No, I've been trying. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're we're going to wind down now, so I want to thank you, Ricardo, for this incredible uh, hour and a half of, of, of talk and, and conversation. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we will follow the success of the book eagerly and are so pleased to have had you uh, on, as you said at the beginning, on both ends of the project when it was new and now that it's, it's published. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank you so much, Roland. It was a pleasure. And thank you to everyone who made time out of their Wednesday to come to the webinar. And uh, for the audience, uh, an announcement uh, that everyone who registered for today's event was automatically entered into a drawing to receive one of three signed copies of Ricardo's book, The Indies of the Setting Sun. And so I would like to announce the winners of the book. They are Ana Toledano, Scott Lankford, and Rafaela Acevedo Field. So we will be in touch with all three of you about getting you your, your signed copies. Thank you, thank the three of you, and thanks everybody for joining us today. And before we go, I would like to remind you to please hold March 31st for the next event in another of our series, Inside the Center, featuring Marcy Kwan, Assistant Professor of Art History at Stanford, and also a current fellow at the Humanities Center. She'll be discussing her forthcoming book, Enchantments, Joseph Cornell and American Modernism. More events are always being added to the calendar, and I hope you will join us again in the coming months. So as always, check out our website for details, shc.stanford.edu. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you to the audience, and we hope to see you again soon.